Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Father Boniface, Benedictine priest and monk of St. Vincent Arch Abbey in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and I'm delighted to join Father Tony Gargata, priest of the Diocese of Pittsburgh today, as he shares with us his journey of faith. Father Tony, thanks for taking the time with us. Thank you for asking. Father Tony, is he grew up in the South Hills of Pittsburgh, and we got to know each other when he attended St. Vincent's Seminary after a couple of years at St. Paul Minor Seminary in Pittsburgh. He did his major seminary at St. Vincent in Latrobe. We're going to take this uh, a moment now to entrust everything to Our Lady so that she can help Father Tony in sharing his journey and help us to hear what the Lord wants us to hear in this time. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Francis, pray for us. St. Anthony, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Tony, it's so great to be with you, and I've heard uh, bits and pieces of your journey of faith, but I'm looking forward also to hearing about how the Lord has been at work in your life. Well, again, it's happy. I'm happy to be with you this morning. My journey of faith, I would really have to say it starts when I was a child, and it's been an up-and-down journey until this very point. When I was young, I was an only child. Um, my mother had some difficulties having children. And it was my mom, me, and of course my dad. And when I was eight years old, my dad died tragically in an accident at work, uh, very unexpected. And I think that's really when my faith journey started. And I shouldn't say that. It should probably started before because both sides of my family were very religious. I grew up around aunts and uncles and grandparents that prayed the rosary every single day. Some of them went to mass every single day. And so uh, that's really where it started. That was my foundation. My mom and dad made sure that I had a prayer life every night before I went to bed. Could not go to sleep without that prayer life. And I remember after, after uh, dinner, almost every evening after dinner, we would sit and pray the rosary in the living room. So those are the earliest memories I have. After my dad died, uh, my mom had a very hard time with that sudden death. She was not herself, kind of withdrawn. My grandmother had moved in with us for a while. And then there was one day that my grandmother actually had walked home from Beachview in Pittsburgh to Brookline in Pittsburgh to pay her rent. And she was trying to get my mother to get up and get out of the house. And we were going to go bowling. So we were going to walk up and meet her in Dormont. And after she paid her rent, she was going to walk back to Dormont. And we were going to walk. My mom didn't drive at that time. And as we were walking, West Liberty Avenue, if you're familiar with that area, at the intersection of Potomac, we went across the street. And my mother tripped and fell. And she laid in the middle of the street, and the light turned green for the cars. And I started seeing the cars coming toward her, and I started screaming because I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, there was a lady and a boy. They came off the curb. They were dressed almost exactly like my mother and me. Helped my mother up, took her over to the curb, brushed her off of the dirt, Asked her if she was okay. When my mother said yes, they start walking the other direction. And there was something about them. I, I, I was so drawn to them. I couldn't, couldn't get my hands off of them. So I turned around once as we were walking the other direction. And I saw them walking away. And then we took about two more steps. And I pulled on my mother's hand. I remember to try to let go of her hand. And I turned around and they were gone. Now, I don't know who that was, what that was. I've always felt that possibly it was our guardian angels mm. since it looked kind of like us. They were <laughs> wow, dressed like us, amazing. but they just, they vanished into thin air that fast. Now I know I was eight years old and I know my conception of that might be a, a understanding that might be very different than, than what the reality was, but that really had an impact on me. After that, I had asked my mom if we could do something that was a tradition of my father. Every Monday night, my father would take me downtown to St. Mary's of Mercy uh, in Pittsburgh to the Miraculous Medal Novena. After he died, we hadn't done that. And so I had asked her um, after this bowling incident if we can start to do that again. Mm. So it became a Monday 
event for me and my mother. We would get on the trolley, go downtown, go to Novena, eat dinner, and come home. Or maybe it was the other way around. I think we ate dinner and then went to Novena and came home. And um, I, I remember those days in St. Mary and Mercy Church were, were some of my fondest memories. Grew up at St. Catherine of Siena. Also, I have to say, and uh, I have the pleasure to work with the Sisters of St. Joseph again here at St. Bernadette. The Sisters of St. Joseph of St. Catherine uh, really instilled a lot of spirituality in my life. Um, we had a grasp, an understanding of Vatican II in seventh grade that I think most adults today still don't even understand. Wow, that's great. It was, it was incredible. And i just like to, to thank them again for that. But, of course, my grade school days were filled with very much spirituality. Then I went off to high school. It was South Catholic for the first three years. And South Catholic merged with Elizabeth, Elizabeth Seton High School. And then we were, uh, so when I went, it was a boys' school. And then my last year, it was Seton LaSalle. So it was a merged school. But in those days, obviously, there was more priests. And so we had a chaplain on site every day. And we were allowed to skip homeroom, sign in at Mass, and go to daily Mass if we wanted. Wow, beautiful. It was. It was beautiful. And so I start going to daily Mass with my friend Steve, Steve Luteran, in case anybody knows him is listening, because <laughs> Steve is very influential in the rest of my journey. Me and Steve would go to daily Mass uh, for those years in high school, and I just I loved church. Um, we were pretty poor. Father Gentile, Carl Gentile, at St. Catherine, my home parish, had hired my mother to do some side work just to give us some extra money. Mm. And so I remember there would be many days that after school I would spend with her in the church while she was cleaning or doing some little odd jobs in the church. Mm. And that always had an impact on me. And I remember one day in the church praying and saying, you know, Lord, I would love to work here someday. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so while I was in high school, in my uh, junior year of high school, pretty sure it was junior year, uh, Father Gentile approached me one day and said, would you like a job working here? Now, I didn't ask him. He just came to me. And he said, would you like a job just a few hours a day to help with some money around the house? And I said, sure. So I started working there as a part-time janitor, cleaning the outside, keeping it clean, and then helping clean the classrooms after school each day. And um, so that's what I did in high school. Um, very religious, very involved with the parish because I worked there. Went to every event that the parish had. Wow. We also had a miraculous medal novena, which I we had, once we started at St. Catherine's, I had me and my mother had quit going downtown to St. Mary's, and I served that novena probably for about six or seven years. Every Tuesday night, served that novena. Wow! Yeah, it was a it was a great time. Very very spiritual for me. After high school, I um, went off to. Um, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, so I went to Duquesne for a year. We really couldn't afford it and not sure what I wanted to do. Things back in those days in 1980 were very different with financial aid. Mm -hmm. I went off to Conley Trade School, and uh, as I was at Conley Trade School, it had been over a year. Me and Steve had went our separate ways. He happened to be doing the same path I was doing. <laughs> didn't know what he was doing, <laughs> and he ended up at Conley Trade School. And so we were dating, and we double dated all the time and did a lot of things together. I still had my spirituality. Somewhere shortly after that, during uh, those years, I switched over to community college for a program in radiation therapy. It was the only place in Pittsburgh at the time that had a radiation therapy program. And so I switched over to do that for a living. And I had fallen away from the Lord at that time. Now, falling away from the Lord is different for each person. I still went to Mass every Sunday. And I had been teaching CCD because I was involved in my church. And so I still taught CCD on Sunday mornings because in order to tell anyone that, I wasn't doing that anymore. It just would have been an image that people didn't understand. Hmm. So I did it more on the, out of pressure than I did for any other reason. Hmm. Now, I still believed in the Eucharist. I still believed in, in the Lord. But my life was not there. From Monday evening until Sunday morning, my life was pretty bad show. Mm. Um, it was just a life of pleasure and, and basically what I wanted to do. I don't need to get into all those specific details, but it was pretty rough. And I was pretty far from the Lord in that way. One night, uh, I had a dog at, at the beginning of those times. 
Her name was, began out as Patches, but then we ended up calling her Patty as a nickname. <laughs> and every night at 11 o'clock, we would go for a walk. And um, often around 10 or 11 o'clock is when my evening would start, night would start. Mm. So we'd go for a walk with her and meet up with people and either drink or maybe get high. And, you know, I felt uncomfortable inside of me. I knew it was wrong, but yet it just, you know, I don't know how to explain it. It's that that's what the world does. It kind of still pulls us into that, that way of life. And one night after coming home and getting high with somebody in the neighborhood who I have no idea where he is or, or whatever happened to him, uh, I walked into my mother's house and with my dog, and I know that I what, did not have my right mind frame with me. But, of course, you get very hungry during those times. And I went into the kitchen, and I went to get some food. And I remember hearing music. Well, right away I heard music, and I thought, oh, the neighbors are having a party. I'm going to go out and join them now. Mm. And I opened the back door to look at the neighbors in the back. Nobody there. So closed the door and went to find something to eat again. Heard music again, same music again. Went out the front door to see if they were having a porch party out in the front in the city and walked up and down the street, nobody there. Came back in, closed the door, heard the music again. Searched the entire house to see if my mom might have had a radio or a TV on that I wasn't aware of. Did not. And the music was getting louder. And suddenly I stopped to listen. And it was the song, I don't even know who sings it, maybe you do, but Cherish Me As Much As I Cherish You. It's an oldie. You know, and I just kept hearing that, that over and over, cherish me as much as I cherish you, and I do. And it hit me. It hit me so hard. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> it hit me so hard that um, and that was a, a huge change in my life right there, that I believed at that moment the Lord was speaking to me and telling me that he cherishes me, and he wants me to cherish him again and, and to become who I was. Mm, how beautiful. Yeah. It has an impact. It's something I never forgot. After that, I still went through my struggles. By this time, um, I was working as a radiation therapist, and I'd worked a couple years in McKees Rocks, McKeesport Hospital and then Forbes Regional in Monroeville. And um, I was really trying to change. It was very hard because the people that I had become friends with, I was known as the <laughs> I was known as the organizer of fun at work <laughs> <laughs> because we had a freestanding radiation therapy unit, which means that any patients that were in the hospital, which had only been about three or four, maybe five a day, compared to like the fifty other patients, would come by ambulance. And so there was about three ambulance companies that were our main deliverers of the patients. And uh, every payday, we all had the same pay schedule. I would organize these huge parties. <laughs> and where we're going to meet on payday and how we would get there, and how, you know, and so on. Well, after this experience with the Lord and cherish me as much as I cherish you, that had to change. And it was very hard because people didn't understand. And um, I started backing off as much as I could. It was a very hard journey to do that. Mm. In 1990, I'm going to jump to 1990 now. In 1990, both of my grandmothers took ill. Uh, my Italian grandmother who spoke very little English, um, was in the hospital. She was in for three months. She was very afraid to be in the hospital overnight. Of course, growing up from an Italian culture, if you go to the hospital, she thought that she was dying. That was it. She was never coming home again. So she was afraid to stay there. She couldn't speak English. Not that I could speak Italian. But, <laughs> <laughs> but somehow we understood each other. <laughs> And I don't understand how to this day, how we did. <laughs> but somehow I knew what she was saying most of the time. A lot of hand gestures. Yeah, a lot of hand gestures. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so I stayed at the hospital with her. And I stayed there every night. There was one uh, wife of a cousin who would come one night. So six nights a week, I would be staying at the hospital with her. At the same time, I was feeling very weak about my new life and had went back into pretty heavy drinking again. So my pattern was I would work eight to 10 hours a day. I would run home and work out, lift some weights, do some jogging. I would take a shower, eat dinner, 
and go to the hospital. Oh, no. Eat dinner, go out with my friends, have as many drinks as I could in about 45 minutes to an hour, and then go to the hospital and stay overnight. Get up the next morning, stop at my mother's house, take a shower, and go back to work. I did that for three months. Mm. And I was pretty wore down, but continued to be able to keep it up. I was still rather young. And um, she came home from the hospital. Two weeks later, my other grandmother went into the hospital. Well, on that side, my mother's side of the family, me and my mother are the only ones in Pittsburgh. Her brother is in Chicago. And knowing that I just spent every night with my Italian grandmother in the hospital, <laughs> I had to spend every night with my other grandmother in the hospital. But this time I didn't get an overnight break. It was seven days a week, seven nights. And I did the same pattern again. But this time was the next big experience. During about halfway through that, she was in for three months until she died. Uh, about halfway through, I uh, went into church one morning, and I was coming out of church, and I was never really an avid reader, and I saw these pamphlets. So I said, well, this will pass some time in the hospital. So I grabbed the pamphlet, and I got to the hospital, and I start reading it. And it was a pamphlet from Medjugorje. And it was nothing real deep. It was the five main messages. And as I read this three, I guess it was maybe three or four page pamphlet. As I, the front page was just a cover, so it was a three page pamphlet. As I read it, I started crying because I said to myself, oh, dear God, this is who I used to be in high school. What happened to me? Mm, wow. You know, what happened to me? What has happened in my life? I had asked my mom if there'd be any way that I could take a weekend off of the hospital and go down and see my friend Steve, who you heard about. He was now living in D.C. So she said yes, and we worked things out. And um, I drove down to D.C., and I took these pamphlets down, and I just put them on his coffee table. And I said, uh, Steve, when you get a chance, read these. It reminds me of who me and you used to be in high school. Mm. And that's all I said. We went about a nice visit for the weekend, and I drove home Sunday afternoon. Tuesday morning at work, I get a phone call from Steve. And he says, I need $1,000 from you. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, really? And why is that? And he says, I booked a trip. I said, what are you talking about? He said, oh, we're going to that place. <laughs> I said, what place? He said, you know, the one I can't say the name of it. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he said, that stuff you left on my coffee table. And I said, oh, Medjugorje? And he said, yes. He said, I booked a trip. I said, oh, no, no. I'll Steve, you don't understand. I'm not going there. You know, I don't have any plans of going to Europe. He said, it's too late. He says, me, my brothers and sisters are going, and we put a, we reserved a spot for you. I paid for it. You have to pay me back. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. So I got off the phone kind of shocked. Um, obviously, I was single and had a good job, so I had the money. And so I uh, wrote him out a check for $1,000 and sent it to him, and uh, that summer, we went off. By this time, it was 1991 now. I guess, I don't know when I took the, I'm a little bit confused with the time frame. Did we go 90 or 91? Either way, uh, we take the trip, and I, I drove down, and we went on this trip together. And um, don't want to get into make this a program about Medjugorje, but Medjugorje changed my life forever since that day. It has brought me closer to the Eucharist. Uh, I started seminary in 1995. So from those years, I think I had only missed daily mass in four days from the Medjugorje trip until I started seminary. And during my years in seminary, I can only remember missing mass once or two days during the week. I'm talking about weekday masses. Never missed a Sunday since, obviously. And uh, and then my faith journey continued as a uh, as a seminarian and now as a priest. And this is where I am. But it's... Uh, a lot of influence from the Lord, a lot of, uh, you know, those those little mystical experiences that mm. you have. That's... Yeah, I really see the, the hound of heaven at work. He never gave up on you. No, no. And even during those years that I was dating, you know, I remember it'd be like, I mean, as far as away I was from the Lord, as much partying as I was doing, it would be about every three months, four months, somewhere in there, I would just one day say, hey, you should be a priest. And I would laugh at myself, you know, and say, yeah, right, you know, and I can't do that. And I look at my life and, 
and he did. He never gave up until finally. He got me through his mother. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, never gave up on me. So that was the the lay part of my faith journey. And and what was the what was the the jump from Medjugorje to the to seminary? What uh what what happened in there that you started? Uh, you said the the idea of priesthood was always there. Uh, even wanting to work at the church at St. Catherine of Siena mm -hmm. uh, seems to be an early seed. But what uh catalyzed that move? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, what happened was obviously I took the messages to heart, and I start praying the daily rosary. Went to confession. I'm sure those priests in those days, those beautiful passionists down to St. Paul's Monastery. Mm. And um, one of the redemptorists that was doing a mission at my, my parish church, home St. Catharines, I, I, I think that they were really sick of me <laughs> at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and they see me coming, they would try to run the other way. <laughs> that guy's coming for confession yes. again. <laughs> I remember one day, um, Father Dan Sweeney, not Dan Sweeney, I can't remember his first name, Father Sweeney from the Passionists. I remember one day he said to me, this is great. You should really call ahead and make an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think it was the average confession. You know, I, to this day, I don't know what I babbled about and what I said. <laughs> but um, I start going to daily mass. And that, that's so after the Medjugorje trip, I started going to daily mass. And I had it set that if I was on the late shift at work, which was only an hour and a half to two hour difference in the shifts. But if I was on the late shift, I can come to morning mass at St. Bernadette, where I happen to be pastor now, and then <laughs> go amazing. over to work. I know. It's amazing, isn't it? And if I was on the early shift, I would have to go to the 530 evening mass at the monastery, St. Paul's Monastery. Mm. And so that I worked that into my schedule. Well, as I did that, then the call got deep to be involved with St. Catherine's again, my mm. own parish. Mm. So I was on the parish council. Somehow... The teenagers from the neighborhood who I barely knew at that point volunteered me to be the youth minister <laughs> <laughs> and told, <laughs> told Father Gary Omler and Father Al Burke that I would love to do this and then came and told me that I need to do this. <laughs> well, Father Gary remember asking me and, and I told him, no, I, I can't do that. I don't know what I'm doing. He said, well, it's a volunteer position. If you could just do something with the kids, it'd be great. And I said no for weeks, and the teenagers kept hounding me. So then I became a youth minister and um, was going to Mass every day. And the closer I got to the Lord, the farther away the girl I was dating got from me. Huh. You know, it was almost like she couldn't take what was going on. She kept saying she could. At the same time, I was very involved with my family, and just for the sake of my family, I'd rather not talk about that too much. But I was doing some some really intense things in my family that really bothered her a lot, especially with my young cousin, Jake, who uh, we're very close today. Um, I was doing a lot of things with him because of family situations. And the more I was helping him out, the more I was going to church, the more I was on parish council, the more I was going to novenas, the farther away that we were getting. Mm. So that's what happened during those years. And then um, I still was trying to talk myself out of seminary. <laughs> <laughs> I was still trying to talk myself out. And I remember one day at, at the Intercommunity Cancer Center here in Monroeville at Forbes, I got a phone call from someone who I had been in radiation therapy with, in school with, and he was the chief technician at the Pittsburgh Cancer Center on Byer Hill Road in Mount Lebanon. Well, that was three miles from my mother's house, and he was offering me a $2,000 increase per year. So I took the job. It was a nightmare. Oh, it was probably the worst job I've ever had in my entire life from the day I walked in. The conditions were, were just not good, uh, the work environment. And I even got in trouble because I was growing with the Lord. I was trying to organize a pro-life march group, and I was reserving the bus, and they just happened to call work to confirm the reservation. And I got in trouble for bringing the pro-life issues into work. Oh, my. Yeah. So, and then... I had a gallbladder attack. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I got a gallbladder, I had a gallbladder attack, and it was so bad I couldn't even stand up. And um, I've been having these attacks. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong because the tests weren't coming back that it was gallbladder. And so I called off work, and I was on the way to the doctors. And they called back, 
work called back later that day, a couple hours later, and says, could you stop here this afternoon? I said, no, really, I, I, I'm on the way. The doctor's probably going into the emergency room. I can't even stand up. I can barely walk. You have to stop her in the way of the doctors. I said, I can't. You have to stop her in the way of the doctors. So I walked in holding my stomach, and they fired me. I asked them why. They couldn't give me a reason. So I uh, went through with my gallbladder and found all that out and went down. I had about a, a week in between that and the surgery. So I went down and filed for unemployment. Unemployment investigated the situation. And so I was able to get unemployment because they said there was not one thing written up in my charts or anything. Well, I see, I was trying to talk myself out of seminary. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord was freeing you up. Yes. So <laughs> as soon as I didn't have a job, I was doing everything for uh, my church, being involved with everything during the day. And uh, anything that, that the priest needed, he would call me. So that took the big jump because uh, all of a sudden I didn't have a job now. And then uh, my girlfriend was breaking up with me. So it all kind of came <laughs> together. <laughs> so what do I do now? You know, um, so I start talking to uh, to Father Burns, who is now Bishop Burns. And uh, he was the, the vocation director at that time. Another ex mystical experience during this time, is <laughs> which really, really showed me the, the power and the love of the Lord. I was calling him and thinking about maybe interviewing or talking about seminary life. And in the meantime, I had all this free time. So I had asked our priest if we can start Eucharistic Adoration on First Fridays. Nice. And a couple things happened. I was going to tell you a couple stories about that. One time uh, I was still dating, the, well, I was still dating the girl before I went to see Father Burns. I couldn't get anyone to sign up for the overnight times. So I would often do the overnight times that were blank. And there was a lady cookie, a good friend of mine, Carol. She would take the the two o'clock slot often. I don't know if she was coming off work or what the reason was, but she would take the two o'clock slot. So I would often do the one o'clock. Then if I had to come back at three or four, I would. And while we were broke up, me and my girlfriend, I was in there praying. She would come with me sometimes, and she would come with me for the closing on Saturday mornings. But one night, I remember, she came into the church very loud, distracting. I was the only one in there. And uh, she says, I need to talk to you. And she sat in the pew behind me instead of next to me. And I said, uh, well, just give me five more minutes. It'll be two o'clock and Cookie will be here. I need to talk to you now. She was upset and she's causing all this commotion. I said, I, I don't want to leave the Lord alone in the blessed sacrament. You have to wait five minutes. Just five minutes. Cookie will be here. And She's made all this. She would not look at me eye to eye. And she made all this commotion. Got up, got mad at me, and walked out of the, the church. She lived over in Crafton Ingram, which was about five miles away from my church. Within a second of her leaving the church, Cookie walked in. So as soon as Cookie got in the pew, I left. Got in my car, drove to my mother's, which was two blocks from the church. And uh, got on the phone. And I don't know why I did it. I called. And she answered the phone all groggy. She said, hello. And I said, uh, Carrie. I said, you okay? She goes, yeah, why? Weird. I said, well, you were just in church bothering me, crying. She goes, what are you talking about? She goes, I've been in bed since 10 o'clock. I said, I thought you went out with your friends tonight. She said, oh, no, we canceled our plans and I've been, I went to bed early. I said, you weren't just in church. She said, no, I'm sound asleep. To this day, I don't know what that was. I've always believed it was the devil or a demon trying to pull me away from the Eucharist Wow! because I was growing. So then during this adoration every month, of course, now I'm not working and I'm losing money. And and uh, I'm thinking about going to talk to Father Burns, but couldn't get myself the guts to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so every, uh, every month on the first Friday when we had this adoration, I'd be praying and this number would come to my mind, 2,900. So I was like, oh, okay, Lord, I understand. I'll play the four-digit number, and I'm going to hit <laughs> because I'm praying. <laughs> I'm praying here in front of the Eucharist. This must be the answer. <laughs> so um, so every first Friday after adoration, during the day, the afternoon session I would go to before the evening session, the overnight session, I would walk across the street and play my number and then go home. Never hit. Finally, when I got the guts to go see the seminary, 
that morning. I uh, got there, drove right past, <laughs> and drove around Crafton for a while, came back, drove past the other entrance, went down, <laughs> down, <laughs> down to Carnegie. <laughs> and then I said, I'm just going to go out and make it right and go home. Forget this. I can't do this. This is crazy. I'm already 33 years old. What am I doing? Okay. Finally, I come up and I just, one more time, I, I went to the driveway and this time I turned in. And as I turned into the driveway of the seminary, the address was 2,900. So I was like, wow. You know? So I, <laughs> okay, Lord, I get what the 2,900 is all about. <laughs> you, you hit the lottery, but a different kind of different lottery. Different lottery, yes. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. And then about my first year, not another great experience. So I started seminary. My first year in seminary, what I did is by this time I had some well, I was unemployed now for a while, so bills, I didn't have the money anymore and uh, kind of blew it. And um, my mom had never been rich. My mom had always been pretty poor. And so uh, I uh, was thinking about taking a year off seminary. About a year into it, she had paid, she had taken a loan out to pay some of my bills. And uh, and I just didn't think it was right. I knew she was struggling when I would come home to visit her. And so I was going to take a year off seminary, go work for a year. I didn't care what kind of job it was and then come back. And uh, Tom Murkowski was having a retreat on the farm. And so I went that Saturday. Uh, I don't know why I was able to, I guess we didn't have, after morning mass on Saturday, that's what it was, at the seminary. Uh, so we had seminaries free, uh, Saturdays free. So I went up to the farm, and I was just praying and praying and praying. i like, Lord, you have to give me a sign. Please, Lord. I said, should I leave the seminary for a year? I said, I'm getting older. Will I even come back? I said, should I stay? Where's the money going to come from? And I kept the, over and over. Finally, I said, Lord, I'm going to look straight down. If I see a four-leaf clover here on this grass, because it was outside, it was a retreat on the farm. I said, if I see a four-leaf clover, clover right in front of me, I'll know it's going to be okay. And I looked down, and there was a four-leaf clover. <laughs> 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 well, I got home that week, and that Monday at the seminary, I was told two things. I was told, number one, that there was a lady that was donating money for poor seminarians. So me and another seminarian were, were good to benefit from it. And that the, uh, the diocese had a little bit of a scholarship that they were going to give me because they knew the situation I was in. Wow. To help, help my family. How beautiful. So <laughs> the Lord came through again with that. He's been so, working overtime for you. Yeah, he has to work overtime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm slow and hard-headed. <laughs> yeah. So that's that was pretty much my faith journey up up till seminary. Wow. Yeah. Wow, beautiful to see how the Lord was at work so consistently. And yeah. You were all over the place, but the Lord had a clear vision the whole time. But how right. much freedom he gives you, how patient. Yeah. Patient. That's that's the word. <laughs> patient. <laughs> Yes. So you're in about your early 30s at this point. Yeah, was, when I joined seminary, I was 33. 33. Mm -hmm. Good year. Yeah. Yes, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and the crucifixion began. <laughs> That's right. It sure did. <laughs> yes. Was it, a, was it a struggle once you got into seminary? I mean, you just described the, the financial struggle after the yeah. first year, but... Uh, in terms of your your studies, your prayer, the, the community, or the uh, any, what, did you have a pretty clear vision, or did you have some ongoing doubts as you were moving toward the priesthood? No, I have to honestly say that once I joined, and then after I got over that little hump of the worried about the finances, once I got past that, seminary was one of, most relatively one of the easiest things I'd done in my life. Mm. You know, I, I'm sure that was the grace of God. Yeah. You know, now. Getting up in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Father Bonavis says, you know, you lived in the next building to me. <laughs> it's, it, it's still to this day is not easy for me. You know, I, I have a lot of trouble in the morning, but those kind of little funny things that are, you know, our own personality. But no, it was um, my prayer life grew. I remember one point, and I couldn't tell you when or where, but just feeling it on my heart that I, now that I was praying the daily rosary, I had to start praying the daily stations of the cross. Mm -hmm. And I remember that very clear. And I was already also praying the daily divine mercy. And so those three devotions have been part of my life every day. I do have to say there's been a day or two where just circumstances, you know, 
um, you know, here and there. There's circumstances that you're just, you wake up in the morning and you're just being pulled a hundred different ways and all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock at night and mm -hmm. you sit, try to do those prayers and you fall asleep. I, I admit that, but in general, those three devotions along with my Liturgy of the Hours have been part of my my life every day since I've joined seminary. It's beautiful. Or somewhere in the early days of seminary. And, and uh, well, I find that to be a nice witness of uh, St. Francis de Sales uh, said, basically the devotions you start out with are the, you know, hold on to those, keep those for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, But even though the external practice stays the same, uh, the interior changes. We always, we keep going deeper. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, your experience of daily mass is a little different now. Oh, it's, it was, it's uh, very different. Very different, yes. Tell you about daily mass one minute. The, the only other time in seminary where I had a bit of a doubt was the night before ordination. Mm. And, <laughs> of course, St. Paul's Seminary, if anyone's familiar with it, is in Crafton, well, on the borderline of, of Crafton, Carnegie, and Pittsburgh right there. And the girl that I was dating when I started seminary lived in Crafton. And I remember that night after everybody went to bed, I was so tempted to either drive or walk to her house. You know, I went out and I walked around the grounds of the seminary trying to talk myself out of this. What am I doing? Don't worry, I never left the grounds. <laughs> <laughs> I never left the grounds. And a real interesting thing, I wouldn't say if this is from God or not, but I like to believe it is. The next morning, I remember getting up. That was one of the mornings I was up early. <laughs> <laughs> the morning of ordination. And uh, I remember pacing. I was pacing the halls of St. Paul's. I was pacing the front ground, the driveway. And I was just, what am I doing? My life is going to change forever in a, in a couple hours. And all of a sudden, these turkeys, which is very common, the turkeys came out from the woods onto the grounds of St. Paul's Seminary. And they all opened their fans. Oh, wow. You know, and it was just like... Hello. Yeah. Was, <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just looking at them, and I had lived there, and I had, when, when I was at St. Vincent's, of course, we had a lot of, you know, I've been at St. Paul's for six years, and I had never seen them do that. That's amazing. I've seen them walk the property, but they all kind of stopped and opened their fans. And then just went on their way. <laughs> so I kind of took that as like a rejoicing sign from the Lord. And uh, yeah. And so then I, um, I got ordained. And this is a funny story. My cousin Paul is crazy. And if he, you're listening, Paul, <laughs> you know it's true. <laughs> so as I said, Paul's crazy. And right, the, the tradition was with Bishop Worrell was, which is now Archbishop Worrell, was that after we got ordained, we went over to the rectory of the cathedral and to get our assignments. And so I walk over to the cathedral, and we're all standing in this room waiting for our assignments. Nobody told me about the traditions of the bishops coming up to you and kneeling in front of you wanting your blessing. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, a bishop came up, and I think it was Bishop Winter, but I'm not positive, because there were so many people and I was so nervous, and knelt down right in front of me, and I just stared right at them. <laughs> and then I happened to look over and I saw um, my other friends blessing bishops. So <laughs> they're asking for my blessing. Okay, I get it. <laughs> but I walked outside. Now, usually what happens is your family's waiting for you outside to see where you're going. I walk outside and then this little area of the driveway that goes up to the door where really no one's allowed to drive unless you're part of the cathedral or, or the bishop's car. My cousin's sitting there in his car. <laughs> and I said, you can't park here. you got to move. He goes, get in, get in, hurry up. I said, oh, I said, Paul, my mom, and everybody's waiting for me to hear these songs. Get in. And so like three or four times, I finally got in his car. I said, what do you want? I said, everybody's waiting for me down the other end of the parking lot. He says, I want to be the first one to go to confession to you. Plus me, Father Fry, I have sinned while I'm sitting in his car. <laughs> I said, I don't even know if I know the words off my heart yet. <laughs> so that was that was interesting. Actually, I did. You know, I had practiced enough when it came time to do it. I was able to give him the absolution. That's that, beautiful. that was really beautiful. <laughs> but I, I know we got way off the tangent there. Uh, mass now compared to as a lay person, uh, I, I can't begin to tell you the depth of it. There are masses that I go to that's 
once the offertory procession comes up, the gifts come up, and I get up to the altar, from there until all of a sudden we're praying the Our Father, I have no idea what happened. And it's not because I'm not paying attention. It's because I start thinking so deeply, and I can tell that whole time I'm thinking about mystical things. I don't ever remember, even remember praying the Eucharistic prayer, hmm. you know, because it, it just it gets you so deep, you know. Hmm. That's happened a few times. A few times uh, during the consecration, when I do remember that part, not that I always forget, uh, once in a while that happens, but during the consecration, uh, it, it just it becomes so mystical that this bread and wine has become the body and blood of Christ mm. that I could barely go on with the words. And it seems as much of a, I'm actually an introvert, a lot of people don't, don't believe that, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't like crowds a lot, but it seems like the Sunday Masses is when that happens a lot. Not so much the daily Masses, but the Sunday Masses, when the whole congregation is there and I'm doing the consecration. There have actually been times that I got so caught up that I have whispered to one of the servers, did I say this prayer? Did I do this? Did I do that? Because I'm so caught up in what's happening. And um, it's it's like a different level. It's like I'm there, but I'm not there. I, I can't put words on it. So it's really brought uh, a deep level uh, of, of alive of what's happening at Mass, mm. the bringing present mm. of, of the body and blood of Christ. Um, you know, that in time and, you know, through time to bring that present here and in reality. So, yes, it is. You lose yourself in the lose, mystery. Lose myself in the mystery. Yeah. And there's times after communion, too, when we're praying, I just get lost and almost forget to go on with the, the last, the you know, the dismissal of the Mass, that closing prayer, and, the, and the, you know, just get lost, caught up in that mystery. Can't I can't explain it. I, I would try. I would love to, but I can't explain it. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And your your daily holy hour, the Stations of the Cross, the Rosary. Mm-hmm. You've prayed those mysteries uh, mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of times. Thousands of times, <laughs> yes, thousands of times. And they're not boring? <laughs> no, I can't say it's boring. No. I can't say it's ever boring. You know, one of the things that um, I'm in a very large parish now, for those of you who don't know St. Bernadette's Parish, we have 2,500 families, 7,500 people. And right now we're down to a single priest parish. And um, a lot of people were concerned about me, and the parishioners are concerned about me having multiple masses in a day. Now, I know there's guidelines from the, the Vatican, and we have to observe them as much as possible. But that doesn't tire me out. That's what I try to explain to the people. You can give me four, five, ten masses, you know, because I get so caught up in it. It's never, ever boring. You know, it's never, I could do three, four in a row, and each one is new mm. and beautiful and, mm. and spiritually uplifting in some way, you know, and each one is different in a different way, you know, uh, even if it's the same liturgy. Right, you know, right. Yeah. Same prayers, same readings, yeah. and it becomes new. Yeah, or something from the Eucharistic prayer will jump out at you, or from the, the uh, one of the other prayers, or something from the reading that never jumped out at you before, you know. And then your whole mass will be caught up in that phrase, or mm. that mystery. You, know? mm. you just become more and more configured to the sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, can you, you, you've been, you've had a few different assignments as a, as a priest in Pittsburgh, and have moved to a, a few different places. Uh, this is your second parish as pastor. Yes. Or where well, you had two parishes at the same time before. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And. Uh, uh, can you share just a, a little bit about how the uh, that experience of of growing as a priest has been uh, from you know your your first parish assignment to now and uh, getting to know these different parish families and ministering to them and just uh, pouring yourself out as a priest? Well, my first assignment was um, Our Lady of the Most Blessed Sacrament in the Toronto Heights, and I was there with Father Stan Gregoric as his pastor. I went in being still the rough city person that I was. <laughs> Not that I was living a bad lifestyle, but my personality, you know. And, street um, kid. Street kid, yeah. <laughs> but I have to say that I think with the delay in, in my vocation, that the Lord has blessed that because I never changed who I was. I'm the same as with you, as I am with the parishioners, as I am with my family. Mm. I'm the same. I try to be the same person. I mean, I don't think about that. Didn't know it was happening. 
But I got so far into the lives of the people that when I got that transfer, after my three and a half years, I, I could barely talk. I was crying so hard. Mm. I remember Father Lester Knoll, his relatives live in that parish, and he happened to be out there for, I think it was a baptism on the day, the weekend, and it was my last weekend. And uh, he said hi to me, and I just start crying in his arms, <laughs> just about, you know? <laughs> and I just, um, because I didn't want to leave. And, you know, people, so many people said that, you know, that, that journey. And, and I realized that um, at that point I started to realize that what all the things I'd lived through, those good years as, as trying to be faithful as a high school student and uh, those years that weren't so good in my life that was far from the Lord, that the Lord has blessed all of that and has brought that to my priesthood to be a gift. Mm. I think about it a lot as Joseph in the Old Testament. You know, the Lord would have never planned, I don't think. This is my own personal interpretation. I'm not saying this is any other interpretation. But I don't think the Lord would have planned for his brothers to <laughs> sell him off. Him you know? Sell him into slavery. Yeah, right. <laughs> but because of their free will, they did that. It turned out to be a huge blessing for many hundreds and thousands of people, mm. you know? And I see it the same way. You know, the Lord did not want me to go off into the lifestyle that I had mm. and to be who I was. But now that I've said yes to him, he's using all that mm. for his ministry. So then my second um, assignment was here at St. Bernadette as uh, an assistant. It was very short-lived. It was only a little less than a year and a half. Very large parish, so... It was very hard to get to know people. But apparently I did because when I got my third assignment, many, many people from St. Bernadette kept in touch with me, mm. which I didn't realize. Like, you don't realize what's the effects you're having on people. Mm. People start keeping in touch with me by email or by phone or, or whatever. And I, was, I, I kept in touch with probably several, several families over the years. My third assignment was St. Edwards in Blonox and St. Francis in uh, Harmerville. I think that's probably where I grew the most in my life as a priest, and I saw the most fruit mm. uh, so far in my priesthood because it was two separate parishes, and we had worked with the envisioning ministry of Pittsburgh Diocese to see what was going to be the future because at that time, St. Edward only had 500 and some families, and St. Francis only had 200 families and knew that they weren't going to necessarily continue on like that for a long time. And so with the Envisioning Ministry, I worked to bring them together. And um, as again, I just kept being my old self, my city boy, did things the way I did them. You know, no different, no, no uh, false pretenses, no anything. And they came together smooth. In fact, to the point that after I've been transferred from there now, people have actually thanked me for bringing the two parishes mm, together. Beautiful. Now, I don't want any credit for that. You know, that was God, that was the Holy Spirit, that was however that worked. But I see the fruits by just saying yes to God, no matter how hard the assignment is. Because the thought of bringing those two parishes together was overwhelming. <laughs> how would you do this, you know? Right. Yeah, and it's um, it's beautiful, but it's just a beautiful thing. So it really grew a lot there. And, and here I am now at St. Bernadette with a large congregation. Growing each day. Growing each day. It's Growing beautiful. each day. Yes. Um, we just have a, a a couple minutes left. I just I know that the saints are really important in your life, and and just uh, wonder if you could share just for uh, two minutes about a a saint that's really uh, touched you or been uh, important for you. Obviously, Our Lady, uh, yes. as we've talked about, but any of the other uh, saints. Well, I'd like to start first with um, Saint Joseph. You know, somewhere in seminary days. I had this profound experience of St. Joseph, of who he was. And ever since sometime, I think it might have been St. Vincent, it could have been St. Paul's, but sometime in, Saint Vin in seminary, I've been praying that I could be a father in the church in a manner that St. Joseph was father of the Holy Family. Mm. Because I realized his virtues and his yes to the Lord. Imagine, you know, talking about overwhelming with the two parishes I was just talking about. Imagine, you know, here's Mary, pregnant, then having this vision or this dream or however it really was 
that from an angel to believe that to have that kind of faith mm. and to say yes in that that's the only way priesthood can work this <laughs> is if you do that you know it's if it's the only way it can work mm. obviously saint anthony i was named after him i had a brother who was named anthony who only lived two days mm. and uh my mom had a lot of trouble having children and when she was pregnant with me my dad made a novena to saint anthony oh wow and when I was born, I was born emergency, C-section, um, a month early. They didn't think I was going to live. I was baptized as soon as I was born. And, uh, but my dad continued his prayers to St. Anthony. And here I am. So <laughs> <laughs> It's working out so far. St. <laughs> yeah. um, Teresa of Lisieux, any time in my life, I've prayed to her. I can go on with a list. I have a list in the morning, you know, <laughs> that I have a little litany of my own saints that I pray to. So, yeah. You have a lot of patrons. Yes. It's beautiful. It has been beautiful to, to hear your faith journey. Could we conclude with a prayer? Would you be willing to lead us in a little prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for the gift of priesthood. I thank you for calling me into this gift. Through your blessed mother who said the perfect yes, through St. Joseph and all the saints, mm. I ask you to continue to bless all of us, bestow your blessings on us, your graces on us, so we can truly become all that you want us to be, that so we can see through all the clouds of this life, all the words and all the visions of this world, we can see through all of that, so we can see what you really are calling us to be and who you are calling us to be. So together we can give you glory for all eternity as we pray. Mm. Glory be to the Father, and, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. And through the prayers of our Blessed Mother and all the saints, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Tony Gargata, it's been so great to share with you.